since uh, uh, time uh, limitation, the definition of citizenship is both on national identity. That needs to be discussed in detail. Second, general social perception is formed like this. So, divide Muslims demands of religious references while organizing lifestyles and relations with the government. Government operations and regulation do not allow this. The mental problem of especially devoid Muslims in Turkey with the government and in consequence with the situation. Finally, the sensitiveness of religious people, Muslims or the individuals not having the political power within the current conditions is not considered in law, regulations and implementations. Citizenship education provided by the formal or informal ways in school curriculum is given within problematic perceptions. Current problems are deepened by political government and political parties. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Turan. Now uh, we have uh, time for questions. Uh, but also, we had initially an idea that to have, a, you know, but I think we can skip that, right? Dr. Kula is going to respond to this, but because of time concern, uh, we might just skip that one. I'm happy to skip. Yeah, no, oh, thank you very much. Because I, I'm sorry that we asked you, and then we are not allowing you to do that. <laughs> But that, uh, that's, you know, it's because it's the second uh, time this it, is it's his way of making sure I follow <laughs> everything that comes up with brilliance, which I failed to do, but you'll never know. He's very smart, that's why he makes it to, to take notes very carefully, so that in future you'll need those notes, maybe. But now I think we can take questions. Um, there are perhaps many questions. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, I have just two questions to Professor Alexander and then to Aline and just to congratulate to Professor Turan. Uh, to Professor Alexander, do you think that the state of Israel is nowadays far from this combination you said, maximum citizenship education and big moral theology? Uh, do you think it's far from it? And second, even the context, you know better than anybody the context now. Do you think you and Palestinians can live someday? No, live not someday, sharing that combination. I'm, I'm not saying soon, but uh, someday this century. And second, to Eileen, you said that uh, in public school. There are not uh, religion. There are not religion in public school. But I was an exchange student, and uh, in the, in the states, and we pray every morning. You know, it's a kind of patriotic prayer. It's not that a contradiction. Yeah. And then you were talking about tolerance, and you define it as treating the other like brothers. I think I don't know if that's a maximum or a thick, not treating the other like as brothers. Solidarity. So, well, solidarity. I don't know if this is a maximum or a, or a thing, but I think this is an active concept because it has three elements. First, not only respect the other, not only answer the other when you are called, but go into the encounter without being called and you know, with the risk of, of being labeled as a freak, you know? <coughs> but that's nice, but I don't know if I live in other planet, but I only see this in seminars and in books, but not in the reality. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. Well, I'm more qualified to answer the first question than the second question. I don't know that anybody's qualified to answer the second question. Um, as far as... Uh, I think Israel is a great place, uh, and I think it's sad and unfortunate that it gets portrayed as it does, especially in the Western media. And uh, some of you have asked me about this, and if you hear a, a certain sense of annoyance in my voice when I respond, it's because I sort of get tired of the question. Um, my niece, who lives in Philadelphia, came to visit last summer, and she was afraid to come to Israel in part because of the media. And when she came and she landed in Tel Aviv and she, we spun, my, my, my brother adopted two Guatemalan women. They were 
babies when he adopted them. So this is a, a young person of color who's been raised as a, a Jewish young person in Philadelphia. And she comes to Israel and she lands in Tel Aviv and she looks at it and she said, this is what it is? You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it, it's really a lot better than it's portrayed. So my answer to your question is, do we, do we uh, seek and struggle with the balance of what I was talking about? My answer is an unequivocal yes. I'm very favorable and positive. Now, when I'm favorable and positive about Israel society, doesn't mean I think it's a perfect place. And when, I, when I'm in Israel, I spend a lot of time criticizing Israeli society, Israeli education, because that's my job as a philosopher, and I try and do that uh, well. So uh, do I think there's lots of problems with Israeli society? Sure I do. We have lots of problems. But fundamentally, uh, culturally, economically, and so on and so forth, it's a great place. As to do with Jews and Palestinians are, uh, 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 living together, I would say the following. Um, within the state of Israel, uh, we do so already. And I'd like to say about the University of Haifa, it's proof that peace in the Middle East is possible because we live it every day. 20% of our students are Palestinian citizens of Israel, at the undergraduate level 30%. Do we live a perfect life together? No. Do we disagree with each other? Plenty. Are there points of conflict and tension and sometimes that border on violence? Yeah, there are. But then, so too are there in New York and in Chicago and in Los Angeles, my, my daughter went to school at Johns Hopkins and in Baltimore, and two kids were, two undergraduates were murdered on campus in the years that she was there. I couldn't wait till she got out of Baltimore and back to Haifa where I think it's safe. So, so um, uh, the answer is, within, within the boundaries of a liberal democratic state that is, that is the state of Israel, yeah, it's possible. What do I think the fundamental problem in our deliberations with uh, the Palestinian Authority are. They go back to the fundamental point that I made earlier, which just has to do with the mutual recognition of, of our fundamental national identity. And it, I'm sad to say that it's still the case that even the leading lights of liberal Palestinian society, and I have in mind Sari Nisweba, who's the president of Al Quds University, who recently wrote a book in which he defined for me what it meant to be Jewish, and to be Jewish is to be only a religious person which is one of the reasons why I tried to make the case. That, that first of all, with all due respect to Professor Nesweb, it's actually not his job to define for me what it means to be Jewish. And that's stepping out his bounds, stepping outside the bounds, in my view. And in fact, Christians and Muslims have spent a good lot of time in the last thousand or fifteen hundred years trying to define for Jews what it means to be Jewish. I don't know. I don't know if it's working for you. It hasn't worked for me very well over that period of time. And I think for most Jews it hasn't. And I don't think it works very well for anybody when others try to define for them what it means to be who they are. So I think the Palestinians outside of the state of Israel have difficulty accepting how Jews have defined their own identity. And that's not the only part of the struggle. And I don't mean by that to diminish any responsibility that, that we as Jewish Israelis may have, because we have plenty of I can give you lots of things we've done wrong along the way as well. I did read in the paper this morning for the first time in a long time some optimism about the current about the current negotiations. I actually too have optimism about the current negotiations, uh, and it, that part has to do with this geopolitical analysis, well, which I'll be happy to share with you later. So I, I do think it's possible, um, but but it's not up to us. And. <coughs> yes, I would like to mention first that in 1964, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it was illegal to pray in public schools. So it's possible that your school was breaking the law. <coughs> it took a while for that to unfold. Uh, well, maybe it, it was not a public school, maybe it was a Catholic public school. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, I already know where you went to school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know when. But um, um, now, um, it, there have been a number of other cases that tested that. Can a group of students gather together and pray in the middle of the school day? <clears throat> it depends on where in the school it is, whether the school is providing space for that, whether they provide space for others. So, so even groups of students with no government authority on it, there's some question over what's allowed today. Um, a moment of silence 
is allowed for some things like 9-11. But, so that, that change has taken place in the time. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the solidarity question and, and treating one another like bro brothers and sisters, <clears throat> in, that, in, in that sense of come when called and um, the mutual respect and voluntarily walking towards the encounter, I would say that in, in my experience, there are people engaging in that kind of solidarity all over the world, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, etc. Et <clears throat> um, people who put themselves in Medicine Sans Frontier would be an example of people engaged actively in solidarity. Amnesty International, sometimes. Um, um, many people who, um, people who have volunteered, we have a, a student who graduated two years ago who's working in a refugee camp um, in Turkey on the Syrian border taking care of Syrians. She doesn't have to do that. She's choosing to do that. And so I think that solidarity, it's not a, and she's, in fact, she's a Muslim who just graduated from our program. She's not a Christian. But I think that there are people engaged in solidarity, global solidarity, who are the, like, they're the seeds. They're the seeds, and if their actions are witnessed, hopefully that will grow. Thank you. Yes, please. Your question. The first, uh, quickie to Eileen. How on earth can you teach history without talking about religion? Um, and it, I know. It seems <laughs> totally absurd. <laughs> It is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and then, um, more substantially, to Professor Sharon, um, how can one talk about effective education for citizenship in an environment where I don't know how to express this diplomatically quite, so don't, don't misunderstand me if I'm not diplomatic. Um, in an environment where being a Turkish citizen explicitly or implicitly means you have to be an ethnic Turk, and a Sunni Muslim, even if you are a Republican, the secularist, the Sunni a Muslim tradition, as one sees, for example, in the work of the DNA, uh, is a privileged position. Um, I hope that's not too undifferent. No, no, I understand the question. In, in the early 1920s, for example, the 1921 Constitution and 24 Constitution defines citizenship totally different. Because from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic, a transition from the Ottoman Empire to the secular Republican state, the founders and fathers of the Republic fo uh, focused and emphasized the importance of being a secular means, the uh, divorcing uh, effects of religion uh, on life, daily life, even daily life and public life. So it's a, it's a we call it's a very French definition of secularism, licensing, the early 1920s. But after the uh, uh, political party change in 1950s, the Democratic Party, uh, democratic elections at that time redefined the secularism in the uh, constitutions. For example, so actually the state basically challenged uh, even the Islam and the, the Turkish as a nation, but definition ethnic uh, those who uh, belong to the Turkish uh, co uh, Turkish uh, country as a citizen called Turks. The yeah, definition of uh, Turkish mean, means that based on ethnicity, but that created tension in the long term. So uh, revised the definition of uh, they revised the definition of uh, citizenship in 1961 constitutions, and in the 1980 constitutions, for example, they made compulsory uh, a course in the content in the curriculum. They called uh, religion and culture uh, lesson. 
that was a compulsory for all Turkish citizens, in which emphasized the Sunni Muslim uh, Orthodox teaching in the discourse. Now, for example, they are discussing uh, more liberal uh, courses. But in the content of the curriculum, uh, we, do not, we did not allow the religious teaching, but at the same time, we are in the in the hereditary uh, or unification of the early 1920s. They created uh, Islamic schools, for example, in addition to the public, secular public schools. We have vocational high schools, public schools, but at the same time, Islamic schools called Imam Hatib high schools. So that was an alternative education to the secular education, go by hand by hand. So, but that created a tension between the public schools, which is very secular, emphasizing the curriculum, and the other one is the Islamic high schools, they emphasize the importance of religious education. But even some sects or the Islamic movements did not accept the Islamic schools. They see that this was the control by state, which is the, the religious education, even in public schools, are also uh, you know, more secular uh, in nature. So, quick discussion. Yes, Dr. Cole, please. First of all, I thought it was sabotage for a minute. <laughs> First of all, uh, guys, um, thank you. Uh, I know at that moment we stay awake um, in order to ask very clever questions, but I think I would have stayed more than awake. Um, congratulations because it's been a hell of a long day, and the fact that you managed to keep us alive and entertained, well done. Um, I, uh, my question is really directed at uh, Hanan, if it might be. Um, uh, and I think, I think I felt amazingly vindicated during the course of your talk. Um, in the, in the uh, 80s, I, was, I, I headed a very large team of, of anti-racist teachers in the city of Birmingham, and we had a very clearly articulated notion. So, for example, uh, it would be that we wanted people of uh, British, Pakistani, Muslim heritage.